Hi, today we're going to talk about the first law of thermodynamics. Our goals for uh, today are first to introduce what we call the PV diagram. That's a graph of pressure as a function of volume. We will start talking about the first law of thermodynamics, which is simply energy conservation applied to a thermodynamic system, like a container of ideal gas, for instance. And then we're going to see how we use the PV diagram to uh, find the work done by the gas in a particular process. Okay, so here we have a PV diagram. We have pressure on the vertical axis, that's in units of kilopascals. We have volume on the horizontal axis in units of liters. We have four states marked on the PV diagram here. So I'm going to claim that uh, PV diagrams can be very useful and we'll talk about a few different ways to use them. So first of all, you can actually use that information, just what's on the graph, to rank the four states based on temperature from greatest to least. Now what we're going to assume is that the four states shown are say we have a closed container of ideal gas and that same container with a fixed number of moles can be in one of these four states, one, two, three, or four. The pressures are different, the volumes are different in the, two, in the four different states, and the temperatures are different. Some of the temperatures and pressures and volumes are the same, but uh, each state has a, a unique set of uh, pressure and volume and so you can rank them. How do you rank them? Well, you go back to the ideal gas law and you say, well, we're keeping N and R the same. So you're ranking by T, well, PV equals NRT. So uh, ranking by temperature is the same as ranking them by the product of P times V. So in this case, state two has the largest value of P times V, 80 kilopascals times eight liters. Uh, 1 and 3 are actually the same as each other. 80 kilopascals times 4 liters for state 1 get you the same as 40 kilopascals times 8 liters for 3. And then we have state 4, which has the smallest uh, combination of pressure times volume. And in fact, the temperature in states 1 and 3 is twice that of the temperature in state 4, because P times V for either state 1 or state 3 is two times P times V for state four. And we also have a factor of two in temperature going from state one or state three to state two. State two has a higher temperature by a factor of two compared to the temperature in state one or state three. Again, we're just looking at pressure times volume. And because PV equals NRT, we can say temperature scales as P times V. Okay, so that's one thing we can get out the PV diagram. We can get information about temperature. So we'll take that a little further. And often you do these, you draw these funny lines on the, uh, or you see these funny lines on a PV diagram. And uh, we have a green line here and a blue line with various points marked. And if you look carefully at it, you see on the blue line, for instance, one of the points is at 120 kilopascals in one liter. There's also a point at 60 kilopascals and 2 liters, uh, 40 kilopascals and 3, 30 kilopascals and 4 liters, 20 and 6, etc. There's also be 10 and uh, 12 would be another point. And P times V is the same for all those points. So all those points have the same temperature. So this blue line is a line of constant temperature. So is the green line. In fact, the green line uh, is, connects all the points at a temperature twice that of the blue line. And so this is what is called an isotherm, a line of constant temperature. And it's always going to be a curved line like this on a PV diagram. And again, isotherms satisfy the equation. P times V is a constant. So all the blue points have the same P times V value. All the green points have the same P times V value, and that P times V value is twice that for all the blue points in this particular case. Okay, we will come back to PV diagrams before we're finished today, but uh, 
let's talk about thermodynamics. We should define it first. What is thermodynamics? And it is the study of systems that involve energy in the form of heat and work. So a refrigerator is a thermodynamic system. A car engine is a thermodynamic system. We've got heat and work involved in all those things, air conditioners, things like that. Okay, so here's a very simple example. We have a water bath that's at a temperature of 90 degrees Celsius, and we put into that water bath a, a container of ideal gas at 20 degrees Celsius. And this container of ideal gas, this cylinder, has a piston above the gas that seals it off from the atmosphere. Uh, but this piston is free to move up and down without any friction at all. So what's going to happen here is that when you place the 20 degree object in the 90 degree temperature bath, the water bath, we're going to get some energy transferred. And this is what we call heat. Heat is going to be transferred from the hot water into the cooler cylinder. So where does this energy end up? So we have a flow of energy into this uh, cylinder of ideal gas, and where exactly does it go? And we're also going to assume that our, our reservoir of hot water is uh, big enough compared to our cylinder that the uh, water doesn't cool down at all. Okay, we're not going to worry about cooling the water. We're just going to worry about increasing the temperature of the um, cylinder of ideal gas. Okay, so eventually we're going to reach equilibrium, and that means everything's at the same temperature. So our system of ideal gas ultimately ends up at the same temperature as the hot water, 90 degrees. I assume that's Celsius. And uh, our piston has gone up, so the ideal gas has occupied more space. Okay. So we've actually place the energy that we've transferred into the cylinder. Really, it shows up in two places. One is the molecules of the gas are moving around faster. Okay, That means we've raised the temperature of the gas. And uh, we actually call this as raising the internal energy, raising the average kinetic energy out of the atoms and molecules. And the gas also did work, because the gas pushed the piston further up. Okay, so it did work on the piston. So some went into raising the temperature, some went into increasing the internal energy, in other words, and the rest of it did work. Okay, so there's that same sentence. Uh, now we apply energy conservation to this. So we say the heat we added showed up as the change in internal energy, delta E internal, plus the work. And this is just energy conservation, but we call it the first law of thermodynamics. So what is Q? It's heat added to a system. If it's negative, then it's taken away from the system. If it's positive, it's added. E internal is the internal energy, the energy associated with the motion, the kinetic energy, in other words, of the atoms or molecules. Note that what's in our equation, though, is delta E internal. So delta E internal is the change in internal energy. And it turns out that that's proportional to the change in temperature. W is work done by the system. This may or may not be the same as your, uh, what you define work maybe when you saw this in chemistry, but we, in physics, say W is work done by the system. And the first law is often written in a, with delta E internal on the left-hand side, so that would be delta E internal is Q minus W, but of course that's the same equation as Q is delta E internal plus W. Doesn't matter how you arrange the, uh, the variables. Okay, but again, it's just energy conservation applied to thermodynamic systems. So let's go back and address what work is all about. Okay, so if you remember earlier in the course, we defined work as force times displacement. And this is pretty much true as long as force is constant and the force is directed in the same direction as the, as the displacement. We also know that force is pressure times area, so we can throw that into our work equation. Work is pressure times area times delta x. And then we can just combine the x and the a and say, well, an area times a length is just a volume, so it's pressure times change in volume. 
Okay, so at constant pressure, if the pressure is constant, the work done is simply that pressure multiplied by the change in, vo in volume. Okay, so you can certainly do this for constant pressure. If there's no change in volume, no work is done. Okay, that makes sense. There's no displacement, so no work is done. That's consistent with what we know about work from earlier in the course. And very generally, this is what happens. The work done by the system is the area under the PV graph. Okay, and this is really why PV diagrams are so useful to us. It's a big reason why they're useful. Okay, so let's look at an example of this. So here we have a system in state one moving to state two by a constant pressure process. And then from state two, it goes to state three uh, following a, a straight line on the PV diagram where the pressure and, and volume steadily increase. Okay, so in this case, we have positive work done, okay? So if the volume increases, the work done is always positive. Work done by the system is positive. If the volume decreases, you'll find your work is negative, okay? So in this case, so positive work, increase in volume, negative work, decrease in volume. And this might be a good time to just hit the pause button on the video and calculate the work done in this particular case. And again, it's just the area under the curve. First do it for the 1 to 2 process, then try it for the 2 to 3 process, and then we'll add them up to get the network. Okay, so on the next screen, I will go through that calculation. But feel free to pause and work it out for yourself so you can check your answer. Okay, so let's do the work. First of all, let's think about the units here. So when we do area under the curve, we're going to be multiplying kilopascals times liters. Now those are funny sounding units. What is a kilopascal liter? Well, let's figure out what it is. One kilopascal is 1,000 pascals. And of course a pascal is a force over area newton per meter squared. So one kilopascal is 1,000 newtons per meter squared. One liter turns out to be 1,000th of a cubic meter. 0 0.001 meters cubed is a liter. So you multiply the 1,000 by the 0 0.001, you get 1. You multiply newtons per meter squared by meters cubed, and you get newton meters. That's the same as force times distance. That is a joule. So strangely enough, kilopascal liters is the same as a joule, which is good because we want this to be work. Work should have energy units, so in fact, it comes out directly in joules. Okay. So now we're going to just count squares on the graph. And so we need to know what uh, one square represents here. So in our case, we have each square is 20 kilopascals tall and 2 liters wide. OK, so that's 40 kilopascal liters, which is 40 joules. Now we just count squares. So for the 1 to 2 process, we have 8 squares. 8 squares at 40 joules per square gets us a total of 320 joules of work was done by the system for the 1 to 2 process. In the 2 to 3 process, we can split it up into two pieces. We've got a nice square region, 4 by 4, so that's 16 squares. And then the triangular region, we have a total of two uh, complete squares and then another two coming from combining uh, little triangles and uh, partial squares. So we, in fact, have a total of four, exactly four squares of area in that triangular region. So that's a total of 20 squares in the purple region here in the 2 to 3 process. 20 times 40 gets us 800 joules. So 320 joules for the 1 to 2 process, 800 joules for the 2 to 3 process. And if you want to know how much you have going from 1 to 2 and then on to 3, you just add them up. Total work in this case is... 1,120 joules. Okay, so I hope you figured that out yourself and uh, you get the right answer. Okay, so that's all for today.